Early that afternoon, there was a stir at the community center in Larange, a town located on the bank of Larange Lake, about 220 kilometers north of Prince Albert. At the request of the RCMP, volunteers were gathered for a search operation. They were looking for Jonathan Thimpson, a seven-year-old boy who'd been missing since Saturday, July 8th. One of the volunteers was 14-year-old Sandy Charles, the last person who saw the Thimpson boy. He had told the authorities that on the afternoon of July 8th, Thimpson came to his house to play baseball. No one had heard from the young boy since. At around 7 p.m., the volunteers found the body of the Thimpson boy in the woods near Sandy Charles's house. At first, it looked like the Thimpson boy was sleeping, but as they got closer, the volunteers were horrified to discover that Jonathan had been murdered. Learning that his playmate had died, Sandy Charles went back home. As he walked in the door, Sandy Charles felt powerful and invulnerable, like a warlock. Where does belief end and insanity begin? For Sandy Charles, the line between the two no longer exists. Sandy Charles was a was a 14-year-old boy, uh, uh, a relatively, uh, up to that point anyway, a relatively normal young man. Um, I, I did uh, make inquiries with the police to try and find out if there were any hints as to whether or not there was something unusual or whether this could have been predicted or prevented. Uh, all we know is that up to this point in time, he appeared normal. His teachers had no idea that anything like this would ever happen. His mother had no idea that anything like this would have happened. Over the first few days of July 1995, Sandy Charles was hatching a diabolical plot which consisted of sacrificing an unbaptized child, boiling some of his fat, and drinking it to gain the power to fly, like he had seen in the movie Warlock. In my discussion with Sandy Charles, it became very clear to me that he had beliefs in the occult and in, in Satan, and, and uh, you know his desire to become a disciple of Satan when he was released upon the earth. To, to Sandy Charles' belief in 2000, um, the movie Warlock. I don't. I don't know if it would. If you can blame that on on the uh, the murder, it obviously gave him some influence on how he how he carried out the the crime, though. On the morning of Saturday, July 8th, Sandy Charles told his eight-year-old friend William Martin about his evil plan. A few meters behind Sandy Charles's house lay a patch of woods, the perfect spot for such a sacrifice. The two boys hid a kitchen knife in the woods to use later for the ritual. All they had to do now was to lure a victim. His criteria was that he was looking for a male, unbaptized virgin child. He selected Jonathan Timpson because um, he didn't believe that Jonathan had a father and in his belief that without a father uh, that meant he was not baptized so that's why he was looking for this particular boy when he selected this boy he invited him to play baseball although the game started off in good fun it soon turned into a nightmare for young Jonathan Thimpson Sandy hit the ball into the woods near the spot where the knife was hidden and asked Jonathan to go get the ball. Once in the woods, Jonathan was stopped in his tracks by the two older boys. Sandy grabbed the knife and stabbed Jonathan. He finished off the job by hitting Jonathan in the head with a rock. After Jonathan Timpson uh, was killed, Sandy Charles returned to his house. He uh, went into the kitchen and he took a pair of kitchen tongs and a knife and a soup can. Then with Martin's help he dragged the boy 100 meters and dumped it in the bushes. Jonathan Thimpson's body wasn't found until four days later. 
The next day, the mother of the Thimpson boy, who thought her son was at a cousin's house, reported his disappearance to the authorities. Early in the evening of July 11th, the volunteers found the boy's body in the woods. The body had been mutilated. The next day, the teen and his eight-year-old accomplice were taken in for questioning. The two boys immediately admitted their involvement in Jonathan Thimpson's death. On July 12th, Sandy Charles and his eight-year-old accomplice were taken in for questioning. Sandy was charged for his involvement in the murder of Jonathan Thimpson. With a disconcerting calm, Sandy Charles described the crime in detail. How he had tricked the young boy into going into the woods, then slit his throat and sliced off long strips of skin. He showed very little remorse. Uh, he was very straightforward in, in discussing the details and, and what his beliefs were uh, with me uh, and did so for, for quite some time uh, during a statement that, uh, that was uh, taken from Sandy Charles. He, uh, I think, understood. He understood what he had done, but I don't think he felt any remorse or, or understood the consequences. When Sandy Charles was arrested, he uh, was very willing to speak to the police. And uh, it, was a, it was an unusual opportunity to, to speak to someone who, uh, very shortly after their arrest, who had committed such a horrendous crime. One of the things that, that uh, I was very concerned about right at the outset when I heard about this crime and the, the facts was the possibility that uh, we were dealing with a situation where the issue of whether or not he was criminally responsible in other words, whether or not he was insane, uh, whether or not that was a live issue. And to that end, I did advise the RCMP to consult with a, an expert forensic psychiatrist immediately. Having obtained the teen's confessions, the investigators were issued a warrant to search their homes. There, they found the knife, some tongs, and a can containing the melted flesh of the young Thimpson boy. The can of flesh was in the basement of the Sandy Charles residence uh, in, in LaRange. Uh, I located that while we were executing a search warrant. This was after Sandy had already been arrested for the, for the crime. Um, in speaking with Sandy Charles, uh, I asked him what his intentions were with, with this can, and he advised of, of the, the reasoning why this uh, flesh was collected, why it was placed into the can, and what the purpose of it was. But he advised me that he did not have any intention of, of actually going through with consuming any of this, this flesh. Sandy Charles was three days past his 14th birthday. He was subsequently raised to adult court, and he was prosecuted for the murder of Jonathan Tipson. The young murderer's trial began in June 1996. If he was found guilty, he could be sentenced to life imprisonment with no chance of parole for five to ten years, the maximum sentence for such a case. The defense attorney tried to prove that Sandy Charles was not responsible for his actions when he killed Jonathan Thimpson. It was horror movies like the film Warlock that had warped the teen's mind. A difficult case to prove. What can bring an individual to act out a fantasy stems from the fact that that individual didn't have a chance to develop the mechanisms to repress his drives, his aggressive or primitive pulsions. These kinds of drives are all found in very small children and have not yet been tamed in them. Their upbringing helps them to channel their drives and their energies, their anger, their tantrums, their distress, their sadness. Parents help their children to make sense of this brew of instinctual drives and teeming energy. Unfortunately, in certain circumstances, some children don't have all the ingredients necessary in their social life, their family life, 
for the development of mechanisms to repress and to channel their aggressive drives, their primitive drives. As he sat at the defense table, Sandy Charles, who had pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, seemed to be totally uninterested in what was happening to him. On more than one occasion, he yawned or pretended to be sleeping to show how bored he was. The trial of Sandy Charles occurred in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Um, courtroom number one is a, is a very large courtroom. It's the biggest courtroom in Saskatoon. Uh, Sandy Charles sat in the prisoner's box. And when, when the accused sits in the prisoner's box, he's only a few feet behind me as the prosecutor. I recall very clearly that during this trial, while Sandy Charles was in the prisoner's box, his fingernails were very long, and uh, when I was making submissions to the court, Sandy Charles would often groan or moan in a disturbing way, and with his long fingernails, he would scratch the wood of the prisoner's box. Uh, it was quite disconcerting to go for days with, with uh, this behavior just a few feet behind me. I can recall some of the press even during the break looking at the prisoner's box to see if this scratching had left marks in the wood because the scratching and the moaning was quite loud. After listening to the defense's pleas, Judge Jerry Albright found Sandy Charles not criminally responsible on account of mental disorder. The teen was sent to the North Battleford Psychiatric Center in Saskatchewan. In 1998, Sandy Charles escaped from the North Battleford Youth Center. He was soon caught and turned back over to the authorities and has since remained institutionalized. He declined an offer to be interviewed by Northern Mysteries.